We are studying creation versus evolution. From the Hebrew text, and we're in Genesis, the 16th chapter, verse number 4. But I want to do a little something beforehand. In Kyle M. Yates, in his Hebrew grammar, this is a biblical Hebrew grammar. It's the Essentials of Biblical Hebrew by Kyle M. Yates. We're going to go over some of the, uh, not in depth in, in grammar, but we're going to look at the Hebrew tenses because you can't understand the Hebrew language unless you understand the Hebrew tenses. In the modern Hebrew, some way or another, they just interpret what it says. They do not translate it. And that's where all the problem is, is, is interpretation and not translation. There are how many Hebrew stems, verb stems, Sharon? Do you remember how many there are? Almost. Seven. Seven. <laughs> seven. Seven, the number of perfection. Marilyn, there are seven Hebrew verb stems, okay, which tell you how the verb is made in Hebrew. Now, modern Hebrew just totally ignores this. Your Jewish Publication Society Bible does not translate the Hebrew text. It interprets it according to what they believe, not what it says. Now, what somebody believes and what the Bible says, uh, you know, we can believe in baptismal regeneration, can't we? We can believe that, but that's not what the Bible teaches. We're baptized, uh, why, Sharon? Because we have been saved. We're baptized because we have been saved. Not to get saved. That's a whole different purpose. And we have whole religions that believe in baptismal regeneration. The Church of Christ is one of them. That's the way it is. Baptismal regeneration. Baptismal regeneration. Catholicism. Baptismal regeneration. It is very important that you let the Bible interpret itself. And you translate it. Acts 2.38 says, Baptize for the remission of sins is what the King James says. Well, what kind of a translation was the King James, uh, uh, Marilyn? Whose Bible was it? King James. Yeah. Who was King James? Well, that was probably from the time of Henry VIII. Well, it was after Henry VIII. Well, who was King James, uh, Sharon? Well, that's after. He was the head of the church. He was the king of England. And so he translated that Bible. Why was the King James Bible translated to begin with? They had other Bibles. Um, so that they could basically they could control the people. It's a political. <coughs> well, the reason why King James uh, translated the Bible is because England was being tossed back and forth between Catholicism, which is the Catholic Church, and Protestantism, when their idea of Protestantism was the Church of England. But there was another little furry group that gave them so much trouble, and they hated them because they had a Bible. And they preached the Bible in from the original tongues or languages, as the Bible Baptist said back in those times. They taught the Bible, and they would only accept what the Greek and Hebrew said. And their pastors were well educated in the languages. And so King James decided that he was going to get a translation that would keep the Church of England people from becoming Baptist. But he had to have a Bible because the Baptists preached the Bible. The Catholics don't believe in the Bible. The Catholics believe in the dogma of the Catholic Church and the uh, edicts of the bull or the apostle of God, which is the Pope, which can change revelation as it comes. He has a, a, according to them, he has the ability to, to continue, have continuous revelation. And so he can change things. And boy, have they changed things. As you look here <coughs> in the evolution of Catholicism, you'll see how they change. Here in 325 A.D., Constantine the Great married the church to the state. And then we have a church state. We did have a toleration act of 311, which uh, the Roman Empire said that we will tolerate Christians before they killed them. And all Christians to begin, and to begin with were tolerated. We have the Paterines here, we have the Novations, we have the 
uh, the Montanists, we have the Cathari, the Paterines, and all these people. And, of course, all these go back to Paulicians. Paulicians, Arnulists, and Albigenses go all the way back to this period of time. Here we have the, uh, the Donatists there during this time. We have the Henricians. We have the uh, Bulgarian and Armenian people. The Bibles that we have today and that they had, which this is the origin of the Mennonite and the Amish brethren. This is where it comes from. Because they had to separate themselves. The Albigenses. Albigenses. You remember what Albigenses means, Marilyn? Albigenses. Genses mean people. Albigenses means the white people, the pure people. All right. The Cathari, the same thing. The pure people. Why were these Baptists called pure? Why were the Henricians called pure? Why were the Paterines called pure? Because they lived generated lives. The popes were immoral rascals. The priests were immoral. You go over there in the Vatican today and you run into a, a nest of homosexuality and unbridled lust for each other. They put the robes on and then they play at night and just so all types of debauchery and drugs and alcohol and whatever. But the Baptists lived a different kind of life. Different, different kind of mind. I might say this, that the Baptist, you all people drank alcohol all during those times. I do not drink alcohol. It is not good for me. I'm an American Indian, and I have bad reactions to alcohol altogether. I don't sleep. I just want to go, you know. And uh, sedatives don't sedate me. Sed sedate me, they hype me up. So that doesn't work for me. But all the time in church history... People drank wine, beer, wine and beer. Now, hard liquor makes you drunk. Hard liquor was for one thing. It was for medicine to kill pain. That's what they used it for. And then we have in America, way over here, we have what we call the Prohibition Act, and we have all of these people that are propagating no alcohol and closing all the bars and things. It didn't work. It didn't help morality at all. Matter of fact, it just got worse and worse and worse with these speakeasies and things at back in that period of time. And that's how Al Capone got rich is, is selling people liquor and beer, which nobody else could, could produce legally. We have fallacies in church history. Going back to the Church of England, King James translated that Bible so that his people would be protected from becoming Baptist. If you read the preface... The epistolary preface to the King James Version, you'll say calling, calling the Most High and all that, referring to, these are titles of God, to the Prince of England, which was King James. And then you'll say that uh, it denounced the Popish people and those that will have nothing but hammered out on their own anvil, and that is the Baptist. So if you're a Baptist out there and you're holding on to King James, you're holding on to the enemy's Bible. Because they killed so many Baptists that they run out of firewood when they denounce the King James Bible. But we so easily swallow, swallow it today. We swallow it, hook, line, and sinker. And you have to, when you're preaching from King James, I can preach from King James, and I have preached from King James. But I have to say, it doesn't say this. When it comes to the word church, I have to say this means assembly. When I, when I come to the word baptism, I said this doesn't mean baptism, it means immersion. The Bible says bopto, baptizo. You dip them. The Latin word is mergio. Our English word immerse comes right out from the Latin. It means to dip, plunge somebody. Baptism is a picture of a death, burial, and resurrection. You don't sprinkle them with water. That's rontizo. You don't pour water on them. That's dipto. But you immerse them. All of these things the king of James did not do and so if they said, why, if we translate the word baptizo, immerse, they're going to know those Baptists are telling the truth. He said, don't translate it, just transliterate it, and they'll never know. That's the story. You'll never know, but now you know. All right, now you know. Now let's go into these Hebrew verbs, seven Hebrew verb stems. And we always look at the word katel, cough, katel, Koth, Teth, Lamet. 
The uh, simple active verb in Hebrew is the kyle stem, the cow or call or cow stem. And you would translate this, he killed. He killed. This is simple active voice. He killed. Now, the simple passive is nephel, and that was he was killed. That's passive voice. When you're a passive voice, you're being acted upon. Okay, the same thing in Greek. The passive voice means this. The intensive active voice is PL stem. Always remember that PL stem. That means violence. He killed brutally and violently. That's number three. Number four, the intensive passive is puel. Intensive passive is puel, P-U-A-L. And that was, he was killed brutally and violently. Now we have the intensive reflexive, his pael. <coughs> intensive reflective. Now that means he killed himself violently and brutally. People will hang themselves. They will blow their brains out. They will cut their throats and cut their wrists. This is a violently killing themselves. People inject themselves with poisons in alcohol <laughs> and in uh, drugs, and they're killing themselves violently, yet they don't know that. The uh, causative active voice, causative active, causative active, is that he calls to kill. This is almost like the middle voice in, in Greek. Causative active is hithel, hithel, and the causative passive is hophel, H-O-P-H-A-L. He was caused to kill. He calls to kill, and he was caused to kill. One of them he calls to kill. I calls Sharon to kill. The next one, Sharon calls me to kill. Call, call someone to kill me. Okay? He was caused to kill. So there we have some of these uh, verb stems, the seven verb stems, and we have, uh, we, we haven't gone into the, uh, what we call the vowel markings and everything, because really the vowel markings weren't there. That's all later. Just like in the Greek, the vowel mark, or the rough and smooth breather and acute grave and circumflex, none of those that were there in the original Greek language, all uncials, all capitals, you just had to know what it said, which that's the way I learned to read Greek to begin with, so I had a head start on some. Now let's go, and, and remembering all of this, remembering the verb stems, <coughs> Wayavu, El Hagar, Watahar, Watare, Ki, Harata, what to call? Ger Berta. Be in a ha. And now, now we have the story of Hagar conceiving. Hagar means what? Do you remember, Sharon? Uh, pilgrim, or pilgrim or wanderer or vagrant or calls to wander. That's what it meant. She was a princess. She was Pharaoh's daughter uh, uh, by a concubine, but, but Pharaoh had given her to Abraham to be his wife so they'd have a political ally so he'd have a brother-in-law of Abraham because Abraham had a large army of men. Now, Abraham went into uh, Egypt to, to, because there was famine in the land, and God told him to stay in the land, didn't he? Pharaoh disobeyed him one, or Abraham disobeyed and went into the land of Pharaoh, and then when he got over there, he got scared. We ought to get scared when we're in the devil's territory. We ought to be. And then he went in there and he told his wife, which was his half-sister also, he said, tell them that you're my sister. See, I'm not lying, really. I didn't tell them that you're not a virgin anymore, that I've been with you a thousand times. And, uh, and that was dishonest, wasn't it? That was... He was a used car salesman, so to speak. Uh, like I said before, I've seen used car salesmen. I worked in those old used car sale lots, and they do some unscrupulous things in those places. Well, that's what old Abraham was. He was a used car salesman, except he was a used wife salesman. 
And then it says, and he went in. Let's look at this. Sharon, can you conjugate that verb for me, that why vu? Um. Comes from vu, by the way. But just give me the conjugation of it. Oh, the conjugation. But yeah. In the third person masculine singular style of Alpha is ever imperfect. That just sounded like a professional. <laughs> third person masculine singular Cal Wow consecutive and perfect. Now let's look. The Cal stem was what? Uh, Simple active. Yeah. All right. And uh, here's what it says. What what wava vu? It comes from vu. And uh, now what happens here? It's drawing a picture of uh, sexual intercourse, to tell you the truth. That's what it's talking about. Abraham, he kept on going into Hagar's body with his person and kept on injecting seed into Hagar. Uh, El, unto Hagar. Hebrew is very sexually explicit and uh, descriptive. He kept on penetrating Hagar. And she caught seed. Now, conjugate that one for me, uh, uh, Sharon, that she caught seed. Um, third person feminine singular cow wow consecutive. All right. Third person feminine singular cow wow consecutive and perfect. And that means to catch and to hold. To catch and to hold. She caught seed. Uh, Sarah didn't catch seed. He, he w kept going into her and uh, introducing seed into her body, but nothing happened because she's basically sterile. But Hagar wasn't. Hagar's a young woman. Uh, she's Pharaoh's daughter. She is his political ally uh, with Pharaoh through her. Pharaoh uh, gave her to him and a lot of other slaves and camels and horses and, and donkeys and um, maybe elephants and everything else that he had. And then he gave her his daughter, or gave him his daughter, and Abraham was supposed to marry her. Instead of that, he gave her to Sarah for a slave. Made a slave out of her. Made a slave out of this princess. This is a real, what we call, Cinderella story. Here the princess becomes a slave. And so now this princess now that has become a slave, she has no control over her body or bodily functions or anything that she has in her life. She is a total victim of circumstances now. She was a princess, but now she's a victim of circumstances, and now she is a slave. So Sarah gives Hagar to Abraham for his wife. When you have, when you cohabit with a, a man and a woman, you become married. That's the act of marriage, okay? And she conceived, and then it says here, wat tare, wat tare, and can you conjugate that one for me, Marilyn? That watare, that's the second line down her right hand side? <laughs> the um, inside of the page? Uh, third. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm Okay, third person right. feminine singular. That's right, you did real good. And this word comes from uh, what? Ra, okay? Jire, a ra. Jire, ra means to see. And she saw and kept on seeing that she had caught seed. Remember? Uh, she was accusing Abraham of being impotent, not able to, to have a child, and so now she's going to check it out. And she says, yeah, well, this, this is a young, very old young woman. She's got to be uh, uh, able to. Uh, conceive, and so you have her, and then if Abraham did this and she didn't get to catch seed, then he says, well, see, it's not my fault, Abraham, it's yours. But that's not what happened. This is a, a, a terrible story because this poor girl has no rights over her body or her feelings or anything else. And she conceived, and she was small, her mistress, in her eyes, in her sight, in her opinion. Small. Third person feminine singular cow while consecutive. She was small and kept on being small in her mistress, in her eyes. Now let's go on a little bit further. Now, now the story is out. The whole proof is in the pudding. It was not Abraham, but it is Sarah that is 
cursed of God, they thought. So now she's mad. And let's see what happens. Watamar. Sarai. El Abram. Hamasi. Alika. Anoki. Natati. Shefati. Be ha kueke. Watare. Ki. Harata. Wa igal. Ben be en neha. Yishpat. Hadvar. Bene. Vuvanika. Now let's go and look at this thing. Jeremiah 51, verse 35, Exodus 5, 21. There are cross-references to this one. Now let's look at this verb here, this verb, what to mar. What to mar, okay? Now, Sharon, do you know what makes this feminine? You know what makes this word, verb feminine? It comes from Wyomer or Amater. Uh, because Sarah was the... Uh, it's Sarah, but what in that verb makes it feminine. It's right there in the second letter from the right. The tau. Oh, okay. The tau, that means it's feminine in gender. Okay? What tomar? And she said and kept on saying, Sarah, unto Abraham, El Aram, that little El there, that's a preposition in this case. El sometimes can mean God. But right here, our powerful one, right here, it's a preposition. Unto Abram, uh, my suffering, my insult, my, my injury, my violence done upon me is because of you. Now, she got, he, Hagar got pregnant. But now, remember what happened? We had Rachel and Jacob that he loved. He only wanted Rachel for his wife. He didn't want anybody else. And he ended up with how many wives? Four wives. Four of them. Four problems. And then when Leah kept conceiving, she was so angry with Jacob and accused him of not being with her enough. He said, woman... He got mad at her. Now, he loved Rachel. Rachel means what? Little young ewe lamb. A little girl lamb. Rachel. That's what I kept. Rachel said, it's your fault. He said, I love you more than all these women. How many times have I come into you? I didn't waste my seed. It, it's, it's not my fault, Rachel. I keep being with you because I want to be with you more than anybody else. It's not my fault. And he was mad because he loved her. And she accused him of holding back his seed for the other women. Well, Leah. Leah was having kids right and left because God, she was rejected. So God, well, her first son was what? Reuben. Reuben. What does Reuben mean? Um, see, see a son. Look. Jacob, I've given you a son. Look what I've done. I love you. I've given you a son. And God has blessed me. Well, he kept being with Leah, uh, Rachel because he loved Rachel. And then Rachel turned on him. And here we have Sarah turning on Abraham. Blaming him. Wasn't his fault. God already proved that. He was not, he was not impotent. He was not uh, sterile. It was Sarah that was. Now she's mad. I, I have given my female slave, and she wasn't supposed to be a female slave, was she? She was supposed to be a princess. Into your bed. I've given her into your arms, into your bosom, into your embrace, is what it literally says. Sexual embrace. And she saw, look at that word, watare. Look at that, so tell me about that one, Sharon. Singular. 
All right, third person feminine singular, Cal Wal consecutive and perfect, and tell me what that means. And she saw and she kept on seeing. She, he, she saw and kept on seeing, and it comes from Ra. See over there? Resh, Alif, and He. That's the root. It's a three letter root. And then key, we have here a little uh, word of causation because. Are that? And look at, look at this word. Harata. She had caught seed. She had caught seed. She kept the seed. It didn't just go away. It didn't just flush out. She had caught seed and kept a hold of it. Third person feminine singular, cow, wow, or cow, perfect. She had caught seed. It worked. And I, look at this. First person construct singular, cal, well, consecutive, and perfect. And I became small and kept on becoming small in her eyesight, in her opinion. And let Jehovah, look at this word, third person magnum singular, cal, juicy. Let's look at this word here, yishpot, yishpot, yishpot. Now it's third person masculine singular, cal, juicy in meaning. What does juicy mean, Sharon? Do you remember that? Um, it's volatile. Volatile. And let Jehovah judge for himself in his volition. Jehovah. He already had. He already had. Jehovah. That's Hadavar there. We don't know how to say that word, do we? Between, bene, between me and you. Abraham, it's all your fault. I'm hurt, and you caused it. But that isn't the story, that isn't the story at all, is it? Who caused this? First of all, Abraham lied to Pharaoh, and he gave him his daughter for a political marriage, and Abraham gives the daughter away. He disrespects Pharaoh, one of the most powerful men in the world, and gives that princess to his wife as a handmaiden, a slave. And then she turned around and said, oh, well, you know, it's your fault that we're not having kids, so you, I'll prove it to you. You use Hagar, and you'll find out she's not going to get pregnant either. But that isn't what happened. Wyomer, Abram, El Sarai, Hene, Shephatek. Now, that word there, Shephatek, say thek. Do you see that towel there in that word? That word there, uh, mean, it's a TH sound, shifathek. And then, beyadek, asi, la, hato, hato, benayik, wati anika, arniha, sere, wat. Tiv Ra. Me Paneaha. Now let's go back up here in the beginning. Let's conjugate that verb, uh, Marilyn. Conjugate that Wyoming. Yes, conjugate it for me. Well, consecutive and perfect. Third person, masculine, senior, cow, well, consecutive and perfect. And Sharon, how do you say this? What, how's the translate? What is the literal translation of it? Um, he said and kept on saying. And he said and kept on saying Abraham. He was going on. He wasn't stuttering. He just kept on. He had to try to convince her because she's mad. He, he, and he says unto Sarah, El Sarai. What does Sarah mean? Um, she's wanting to fight. She likes to fight. She's contentious. And is she? Yeah. Yeah, she's fighting. Hine, behold. Behold. The female, our female slave, the, the, the female slave of us. Into your hand. You do to her. You do. Feminine, singular, cow, imperative. You do to her. The good in your eyes, be any ik in your eyes, or in the eyes of you. And she, what did she do? 
Look at this one. Let's let's conjugate that one, Sharon. Let's see what Sarah did. Let's see what Sarah did to the poor little hopeless, helpless slave girl. Yeah, well, third person came in the singular PL, now consecutive perfect. So she oppressed and kept on oppressing. She oppressed, humbled, kept on humbling, beating her down verbally and physically, slapping her around probably. My personal probably, wham, wham. Never will she be do anything right in Sarah's eyes from now on. That remind you of somebody? Yeah. Marilyn? Mm -hmm. To be oppressed and tortured. And she kept on torturing, humbling an oppressor, and she kept it up. And what, t what tense is it? Hebrew stem? Um, PL, so it's with PL, it's violently. She did this violently. She was violent to her. You ever seen a, a mad woman beating on somebody? Now, whose fault? Why did she get mad? She's angry at God, and she's angry at Abraham, and yet she's saying, it's all of your fault, not mine. And she's beating a pregnant woman carrying a child they desired. Yes, but she didn't believe it was going to happen. So she gave this woman to, to Abraham to prove to him that he was sterile, but it, well, he wasn't sterile. God wasn't mad at Abraham. God had shut up Sarah's womb. Beautiful woman. Mean. <laughs> a mean woman. Sarah was a mean woman. And then Sarai, which means contentious, mean, conquering like a princess. And she kept on what? All right. And she kept on running and fleeing from her mad face. This is Hagar. Hagar kept on fleeing and running from this bad woman. Don't blame her. <laughs> you don't blame her at all. You know all about that, yeah. Marilyn? Yeah. Being verbally abused and physically abused and, and, and mentally abused. Yeah. And she kept on fleeing from her very eyesight. Hagar is running. Hagar is afraid. She doesn't know what's going to happen. I'm carrying this child. And I, and I don't have any control over my own body. I didn't, you know, this isn't my decision. And Sarah threw her in that situation, and now she's torturing her intensely because she, God blessed her with a child. Well, now let's see what God does. Her plan wasn't fulfilled the way she wanted. No. She wanted to humiliate her husband and show him, oh, see, there, you're sterile, not me. God's mad at you. She's let, let Jehovah judge between me and you and Hagar. God already had. <laughs> God already had. But he wasn't being mean to Sarah. He wanted to show her that it wasn't her beauty nor her conception that was going to bring forth this child. It was by the power of God. Now let's see. Why im seek ah? Malak. Hadavar al en ha mayim. Ba midbar al hayim. Bedarek shur. So God is the God of the underdog. And we definitely have an underdog here, don't we? Actually, we got two. We got Abraham being beat up verbally by his wife and castigated constantly, and we have now, we have Hagar, which is the total, real, bearing the brunt of all of Sarah's anxious, anxious hate. Now she hates her. Why? Yimsa'ah. This word uh, comes from mitzah, mitzah, mitzah. And let's look at it. Third person masculine seen her cow while consecutive, imperfect. And he found her, Malik. Malik is angel. This is an angel. The angel of Jehovah. And who is the angel of Jehovah? Who went to her rescue, Sharon? Jesus himself, Jesus himself in his pre incarnate form. Jesus, Jehovah in the flesh, went to her. This is the angel of Jehovah, which is usually Jesus. All in. All means at or upon, like epi in Greek, page 153 and 54, and all is 755 and 56. Ain, 
and Ain means a fountain or a spring. Now she's at a spring, and the water, Hamayim, the waters, literally, the waters is what it literally says. In the wilderness, Ba Mitbar, in the wilderness, the plain, the prairie, in the prairie, she's run away. This word here, wilderness, there, it means to drive cattle. This is a place where you drive cattle. Uh, you have to have a trail boss and through very harsh country. And so you have to have a shepherd or a cowboy or a trail driver to get them through safely. Now, she's out in the winter wilderness, and this place is such a hostile wilderness that God has taken care of her. She's been driven away from home. She's run out. She's had all of her stuff thrown out in the street, so to speak, basically. She's run off. She's, she's thrown out. She's thrown out. This poor girl is uh, in a lot of mental and physical torment, and her life is in danger, isn't it? She, what's out here in the wilderness, Bob Minbar? Wild animals and beasts and everything. She's out there all by herself, but she isn't because God's with her. Al-Hayim. El, Al there means at or upon the well, the fountain, the artesian well. In the highway, or along the highway, it's actually bed direct, in the way or in the highway of sure, sure. All right? The highway of sure. It does. Uh, let's go to 1004. And here, and look up that word sure. That's on page 1004 in Brown, Driver, and Briggs. Let's see if I can find this quickly. <coughs> this poor girl's been turned out on the street, except she's out in the wilderness. Sure. If I can find it. See it right all sure. I don't want to put a lot of blank time on the uh, on the camera there. Sure. A lot of it says lowly, a lowly place, whatever. The wilderness is sure. Now let's go to sixteen verse eight. Here we have this little helpless girl out here. She's out on the street. She's worse than out on the street. She's in hostile territory. She's pregnant. She has no food. She has nothing. She's been run off by a mad woman. Wyomer. Hagar. Shephoth. That's a T-H on the end there. T-H. Shephoth. Sarai. Eh. Mize, Bot, Bots with a TH, We Anna, Taliki, Watomar, Me Pene, Sare, Gi Bariti, Anoki, Barahat. Okay, that's the TH sound on the end also. And he said, who's he there, Wyoming? The third person mentioned singing their cow while consecutive and perfect. We're going to translate this and we're not going to interpret it. Who's, who's speaking? It's Jehovah. It's Jehovah speaking here. This is Jesus speaking. Uh, and he's speaking, third person mentioned singing, and he keeps on comfort and keeps on speaking to her. Hagar. Hagar means wanderer, vagrant, uh, helpless wanderer, pilgrim. A female slave of Sarah, belonging to Sarah. And then he says, uh, from, from, eh, from, mise, from where, from this, or from this, from this, you have come. From where have you come? Now, he knows, God knows where she's been. But now he wants her to tell her his heart. 
I want, he said, I want you to tell me what's wrong, sister. Tell me what's wrong, sweetheart. Second person, fi second person feminine singular, Cal Perfect. I have come. I have come. See, that's word from Bo. I have come. And to where did you go? Second person, feminine, singular, cal, imperfect. From where did you keep on going? And then it says, what tomorrow? And she said and kept on saying, from the face, mipene, mipene, that mip, me there, that comes from man, page 580, yeah, and that's a preposition, from the face, from the nose of, from the eyesight of, from the nose and the lips of Sarah. My mistress, my master, my master. I am fleeing. That's feminine singular cal participle. I am fleeing. I'm fleeing from my, from my mean, bad slave owner. And now Jesus is talking. Jesus is talking. Wyomer, Lach, Malach, Hadavar, Shuvi, El, Gibertek, Wehitani, Tashath, Yadiha. And he said and kept on saying to her, the angel of Jehovah, in other words, this is Jesus. This is Jehovah. What does Jehovah mean? He who shall become. I just love to see you guys say that. I love to see you light up and say what that means. Because Jesus is the one who shall become. He really did become flesh. Where in the New Testament does it say that? John 1.14. Say that for me in Greek. Kai hologo sartaganato. And the Jehovah flesh he became for himself. Remember? For himself. You return, feminine singular cal imperative, unto your feminine master. And humble yourself. Keep on humbling yourself. Feminine singular, hithel imperative. Keep on bowing down. Keep on bowing down under her hands. Ugh. Keep on taking the beatings. Keep on taking the insults. Keep on taking the stuff. Just let it run off of you like water off a duck's back. That's hard, isn't it? But who's telling her this? This is God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, telling her to go back. I'm going to take care of you. Go back, I'll take care of you. Wyomer. La Malek Hadavar. Harba. Arbe. Et. Zarik. That word et there, that's et. That's the TH sound on the end of that one also. Be sure and put that et down there. Et wilo yesafel merav. And he said unto her, Jehovah, or the angel of Jehovah, Malik Hadavar, Harbe, multiplying. Here we have hifel infinitive. Absolute. Multiplying. I shall multiply. I shall keep on multiplying your seed. You're going to have this baby. And he's going to become great. He's going to become great because I'm putting my blessing upon him. Now this is Jehovah speaking. Jehovah's talking to this little slave girl that's supposed, that was a princess until, and turned into a slave. This is like a Cinderella story. And not... It can be calculated. It can be arithmetically calculated. Keep on being calculated. Third person, master, saying, an FL imperfect. Not it shall keep on being calculated from the multitude. From the multitude. Now let's go on a little bit further. 16 and verse 11. Wyomer, Lach, Malik, Hadavar, Hinak, Hara, Wayaladoth Ben 
We Karaoth. Shimo. Yishmael. Thank you. Ki. Shima. Hadavar. El Aniyek. You're doing real well, Marilyn. Real, real well. You're reading out loud. That's good. This 16 and ver verse 11. This is where we'll we'll go here tonight. Wyomer, conjugate that for me, uh, Sharon. Tell me how what it should mean. He said and kept on standing. Is that a literal translation? Yeah. That's right. So that's what the Bible really says right there. And there's no doubt about it, is it? No. We know what it says. And then lock. There we have a preposition with a with a, uh, a suffix on it, and it means to her. To her angel. Malak, angel Jehovah, and this is Jesus himself in his pre-incarnate form. You behold. You are pregnant. And you shall have born. That's literally what it says. That's second person feminine singular cow while consecutive perfect. This is like future perfect, okay? You shall have born a son. What does the word ban there mean, Sharon? According to a pattern, okay? According to the pattern of Abraham. And you shall call, second person feminine singular cow while well, consecutive perfect, you shall have called Shemo. Shem means main monument, all right? You shall call his name Yishmael. Who named this boy? God himself. And what does this boy, what does Yishmael mean? Marilyn, what does Yishmael mean? God hears. God heard your prayer. I have heard it. I've heard your prayer, Hagar, because he has listened, Jehovah, unto your Aniak. What's that Aniak? That's your because of your brut, uh, you have been brutalized, you have been persecuted, you have been uh, abused, and you have been afflicted. All right, sixteen and verse twelve. Sixteen and verse twelve. This is the prophecy now of the children of Ishmael, the children of Ishmael. We who, ye ya, pere Adam, yado. Bakal, we odd call, bo, we all, pane, call, eha, yishkon. <coughs> and he, that word and there on the front of that, that's a conjunction, page 253. And here we have like a third person pronoun here. That's like alto in Greek. And he, he shall keep on becoming. Third person master singular cal. Imperfect. He shall keep on becoming a uh, pere. That means a wild donkey. This is a wild donkey. Maryland, a long time ago, you were out in the desert, weren't you? Yeah. And your family were out in the desert and uh, in between getting picked on and murderized. Out there you saw this wild animal. Yeah. What was it? A wild donkey. Now, did that wild donkey show you his ivories? <laughs> he had his mouth wide open. Wide open coming at you. Coming at him. All right, I've seen that. A long time ago, I had a dog named Yukon. He was a, a mixture of a pit bull, a border collie, not a border collie, but a collie, and uh, a shepherd, a chow. I mean, he was really a mixture. And... Uh, and anyway, he was a great dog. I raised him. He was really, uh, he was the most obedient dog I ever had in my life. I used to, act, I'd get him to growl, and he was a great watchdog. And I could sick him on somebody, and he'd go after him until like he was going to eat him up, and I'd say, stop, just like that. And he'd stop right one foot before him and just stop and set. Just stop like that. I scared some of my friends to death with that dog. Just that's what he was very obedient. And he tried to please you as much as he could. And I lived in Fish Lake Valley. I took that dog up there with me. 
from the time I was five years old, I had that dog till I was in my 30s. When I was in Fish Lake Valley, he'd take off, and of course coyotes kill dogs, but y Yukon would come home with a coyote and drag it in and eat it. Didn't have to feed him. He'd drug in jackrabbits, everything else, and he'd go out there over the sagebrush, and the sagebrush was high, and Yukon would really could run fast, but he'd jump up high, and his head would just go like that back and forth, looking where the, where the rabbit went. And he'd dive off in the direction the rabbit was going. And I mean, he'd catch those rabbits. He, he was a really great dog. He just was, had endurance. And if you ever gave him a task to do, he did not stop. He would do it and do it and do it and do it. Well, we had some Brahma bulls that we bred with these Angus cattle. And Brahma bulls came down in our yard and started rubbing on the porch, which, Marilyn, you have seen that porch where they were rubbing on that porch there in that house. And the whole house was shaking. And, you know, they got these big humps on there, and they were scratching their backs and stuff, and the house was just shaking. And so... My dad got out there, and he said, get him out of here, Mitty. And I said, get him out of here, Yukon. Go get him, Yukon. They ran him down the road. Well, down the end of that road, and then you run them on down. It's a mile down to the end of that road. And then you run them all the way down, and the first valley there is Eureka Valley. He ran them all the way through Eureka Valley and at the beginning of Saline Valley, and then the next valley is Death Valley. He was moving on all night long, driving them cattle out there. He didn't come back. We got up in the next morning, Mitty's sitting there, and there, and Yukon's gone. And we follow the cow tracks, or the bull tracks, and the bull tracks go all the way down there. They go across the road, and it, here's, here's Yukon's tracks right at him, nipping at her heels. He's doing his job. And Dale is cussing my dog. Man alive, that stupid dog. Well, I sicked him on him. I didn't tell him stop. I didn't tell him stop. He just kept on going. Well, we drove in the pickup down there, and we kept on trying those bull tracks and, and fo following Yukon's track. He's still with them. We go down there all over. There's Joshua trees and all this stuff. We're right almost to where Saline Valley starts. And we're up here. We're looking down over there. You know, That's Death Valley way back yonder. I don't know whether he's chased them all the way to Scotty's Castle or what. Anyway, if we finally saw him, and I ho we hollered at him, and uh, we had to go get the horses. So we went back. We drove back, we got the horses, put them in a horse trailer, went as far as we could in a horse trailer, then we got off of the horses, and we drove, we drove the horses on down there, and we gathered them up, but there was some wild donkeys down there. And my dad would always give me one bullet. I went rabbit hunting, one bullet. I had a, a Colt uh, 38 pistol, and he put this on you, Jimmy. This is to keep you alive, you know. You got one bullet. He had a whole bunch of bullets, but he gave me one bullet. And he said, if those donkeys get ready to where they're going to ride your horse, he said, shoot them. Shoot them. Shoot one right in the head. He said, I know you can do it. He said, if you shoot one in the head, they're going to all run off. But boy, these guys were coming at us with all their teeth and whirl and kick at us and all this, and we're trying to get the bulls. So we finally drive the bulls. I didn't shoot one of them, but anyway, we drove the bulls. And drove them all day long because Yukon had driven them all, driven them all night long. We finally got up there, finally, and it's about 10 or 11, 12 o'clock at night, maybe 1 o'clock in the morning when we've done all this, driving these bulls because they don't want to go the right direction. But Yukon is really getting with it and Mitty's there, and so we're driving them along. But it's slow going now. We finally got up there and Dale started singing uh, El Paso and Ghost Riders in the Sky. And he could sing like Frankie Lane. And I'm sitting out here, out in the... Marilyn, what's this sky up there look like? Beautiful, beautiful sky with just absolute beautiful, pristine sky with, with the lights. The, the stars are so bright, it looks like you can touch them. And he's singing out here like this, and it's just echoing all across that desert out there. I'll never forget that. But those wild donkeys, that's what he's going to be, a wild donkey. They fight among themselves and anybody that comes near them. And that's the way those Arabs will become. But also, Arabs are a mixture between Ishmael's and Keturah's children. A wild donkey, a male wild donkey, a man, his hand against all and hand of everyone against him. And upon the faces... Of all his brothers, he shall dwell. 
he shall keep on dwelling against the face of them. They will be dwelling all the time around each other, fighting. Fighting, fighting, fighting. This is a history of war. They're going to be like wild donkeys. Fighting, fighting, fighting. We're going to read 16 and verse 13, and then we're going to quit for tonight. Watikra, Shem Hadavar, Hadober, uh, Elaha, Ata, El Roe, Ki, Amera, Hagam, Holam, Raati, Ahari, Roe. Now, where is she? Where is this woman? Where is this? Where is this little vagrant girl? She's out there in the desert by a well. Out there in the desert by a well. What are around wells? What is around springs? These artesian wells. Everything, but everything is there. All the wild animals are there. Who's protecting her? Do you think there's asps out there and serpents and scorpions and uh, jackals and lions and tigers and bears and wolves? All of this. And who's taking care of her? God's taking care of her. I remember when I was in Fish Lake Valley, a little boy. I was out picking up firewood, and I'd go out there in the sagebrush, and sagebrush is really good firewood, and we didn't have much trees down in the valley, but I'd go out there, and we had a wood-burning cook stove, so we cooked on wood. It was Part of it was uh, wood, and then we had um, propane also with it in another stove, but well, I had to go out there and, and, and cut this wood because the oven baked better with a wood stove than anything else, and once you've cooked on wood, you don't want anything else. That's it. Anyway, I was out there with an axe busting up all this uh, sagebrush and the big chunks of sagebrush because the sagebrush, Marilyn, I've shown you, shown you sagebrush that was nearly 10 foot tall. A horse and rider could go out there in this sage and you never see them. And Yukon used to jump up and go like that looking at the rabbits when they were running between them. But I went out there, I got real hot, and the windmill was pumping, and uh, the thing was turning up there with the wind and the old pump was pumping, pumping up and down like that, and it had a faucet on it, and you could go out there and turn the faucet on and reach down and get a drink of water, and the water would run down back into the well, basically. It was not real, it was not real closed up like modern wells. So I got down there, and I, was, and I splashed some water on my face because I was so hot, and I got down there like this, and I started getting a drink of water, and right there, looking at me, was a snake, and his head looked like it was that big. Looked me right in the eye, and I learned how to do a backflip right then. I flipped myself backwards, and I hit the ground out there. And it was a great big giant gopher snake. But when it's like that looking at you, and I didn't see it. It was all wrapped around that well, and it was, had wrapped around. It was going down and getting drinks. He was lapping water up. Well, I flipped over like that, and then when I saw it, it looked like a rattlesnake to begin with. Rattlesnakes, you know, are very poisonous, and it was about to bite me in the face. He didn't have his mouth open or anything like that, but he just looked at my face, and the tongue was coming out. That They smell with their tongue. He's tasting me. Anyway, I run over there, and then I looked outside and looked back in there, and, and I saw that it was a great big gopher snake. He was big around like this. Rattlesnakes are big around. And that was very frightening. But he was getting, that's what was there at the well where Hagar was. All these, all this vermin and all of these wild animals were going there to get a drink of water because it's the only drink of water around. This is the spring. This is the artesian well. So all of these animals are out there and Jehovah God is watching over her and he is protecting her because of the Abrahamic promise. What tikra? And she called and kept on calling the name on the name of Jehovah, the one speaking. Look at that, Jehovah. That's Jehovah. That's Jesus in there. The one, Jesus, Jehovah means what? The one who shall become and who became? Jesus. Jesus. The one speaking, masking the singular cow participle, the one speaking unto her, you are God seeing. Look at that, El Roe. Because, she said, even here, I looked, or I have looked after the one seeing after me. This is the first time 
that God is called the shepherd, the Lord my shepherd. This is the first Psalm 23. She said, he is the God looking after me, the powerful one looking after me. The word El there, she could have used the word Jehovah Jireh. But this is the first person in the Bible that calls the Lord my shepherd. She calls Jesus the Lord her shepherd, the almighty shepherd. The one, now what, what does the word Roe mean? It means to watch over, to care for, to protect. He's the one protecting. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me beside still waters. He feeds me in the presence of my enemies. Was he doing all this for her? Yes. He restores my soul. Well, we went from 16... Uh, where did we, 16 what? 16.4 16, four to 14. Sixteen four through fourteen. Do you have any questions? Wasn't this a beautiful little story? Well, there's one thing about it. She, after she was mistreated, she went back and followed uh, uh, Jesus' order. Yes, she did. And humbled herself. Yeah. And, and kept on taking it, letting water run off like like yeah. those words and stuff run off her like water on the ducks yeah. back. But God watched after her. Now finally she's gonna be thrown out in the desert forever, isn't she? But it's going to be 14 years later at least. All right. It's going to be quite a few years later. And then the Lord still took care of her, didn't he? After all of that. Any other little questions? Well, it just seems, I mean, from our perspective, in our, you know, would Jesus said go back to In our culture? You know, I mean... Sarah was really being the bad one. She was being bad. I mean, and but just for Jesus to say, go back. Go I mean, back. To go bad. back to her. Let Abraham train this child. That's what's going to. Abraham's going to train this child, and Abraham's going to love this child, and then Sarah is going to get to where she hates the child. Okay, and then she's going to demand that he gets rid of that child. And she gets her money again. And she gets her way again. Sarah, the contentious little warrior, got her way again. And then, you know, what happened in the meanwhile? Sarah gets pregnant. Sarah gets pregnant. All right? And she has Yitzhak. Yitzhak. Well, we'll go on and look at that a little bit in the future. I hope you enjoyed this. Those out there in, in computer land and the web, I hope you enjoyed this class tonight. There's a lot of beautiful things in it. Be'er lahai ro'e, the one looking after me. The Lord watches after me. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you. We, we give this message to all in the world. We pray that it, it will comfort souls. It will give them strength in times of hard times. And know that Jesus is really watching after them. No matter what happens and no matter what goes on in the world, that Jesus really loves us. Thank you for the, all the blessings you have given us and given me in spite of me. Watch over us, Father. Help us to glorify you with our lives. Help us to be a blessing tomorrow to someone. Help us be a blessing today to someone. Help us to glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.